When people look at films that are super beloved and then they hear stories about the difficulties or tragedies that happen on set, they then go on to ascribe that production as cursed. Wizard of Oz, Cannibal Holocaust, The Serpent and the Rainbow, Stalkers. Rosemary's Baby, after the film was made. Some uh, unsettling things happened. Supposedly, the voodoo priest had put a curse on him. One of the munchkins hung himself. It wasn't even noticed at the time of the release. William Castle's kidney stopped working. He was convinced he saw the reflection of the devil in the surgeon's knife. There is an idea that if you make a wicked film, you're opening yourself up to forces that could influence your life in a negative way. We have a weird homicide. Charles Manson said he was inspired by songs on the White Album. The Dakota, where it was filmed, John Lennon was murdered right in front of it. They started to riot. We had to get out of Haiti. I always have our time talking about this. You can find a connection between anything if you look hard enough, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. The important thing is to separate the legend from the truth. Was this film cursed? I don't know. It's all part of the myth. tuning in. You're listening to Artist Decoded. I'm your host, Yoshino. In this episode, I had the honor of talking with filmmaker Jay Cheel, and we talk about his documentary project entitled Curse Films 2 that explores the facts, myths, and mysteries surrounding iconic films and franchises. The new season is currently out now and can be watched on Shudder. In this season, they feature The Wizard of Oz, Rosemary's Baby, Stalker, The Serpent and the Rainbow, and Cannibal Holocaust. And note that the episodes explore a lot of touchy subject matter, to say the least, from director Victor Fleming slapping actor Judy Garland on the set of The Wizard of Oz, to exploring the tragedy of the Manson murders a year after Rosemary's Baby came out in 1968, to the on-screen killings of animals and rape scenes in Cannibal Holocaust. And with all that said, I think that Jay and his team do a masterful job at crafting a documentary series that treats these subjects with a lot of sensitivity, consideration, and empathy. And the series is informative and thoughtfully constructed, giving a lot of historical and political context for each episode. It leaves space for the audience's own contemplation while simultaneously dissecting the dark events surrounding each one of these films. If you're a film buff like me, chances are that you'll enjoy watching this series, even if some of the subject matter is a bit hard to stomach and I'm more so speaking about Cannibal Holocaust personally. That film is uh, incredibly hard to stomach. But before we begin this episode, please go to our iTunes page and leave us a review. Or you can also find us on Spotify. If you can go there, leave us a review, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, so here's my interview with filmmaker... Jay Cheel talking about Curse Films 2. Hope you enjoy it. All right, Jay, thanks, uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you taking this time. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I heard you referencing that your short film Twisted spurred the idea for Curse Films. I believe this was in a podcast that you did. And um, I was wondering if you can speak about that short film just for the audience so they know what it's about and also how it spurred this idea. Sure. Um, yeah, Twisted, it's it's about a drive-in theater. So I, I grew up in Niagara. I'm in Toronto now, but um, there's a town called Thorold, which is about an hour and 20 minutes south of Toronto. 
and a place called the Canview Drive-In, which is a four-screen drive-in theater. And it's been there for years. It's I used to go there when I was a kid. And eventually, this sort of urban legend grew out of this drive-in about a tornado that supposedly hit a screen while the movie Twister was playing. And it was the kind of thing where you you know somebody who knows somebody who was there and saw it happen. And um, it was reported on in the newspaper and it, it kind of made, um, I won't say international news, but it, it got <laughs> yeah. some legs in, in the States as well. Uh, in the U.S. And um, so it's become a, an urban legend. And I decided to make a short looking into that story, um, not so much to debunk it, but just to understand what actually happened and why, if this didn't happen, why so many people claim that it did. Uh, and the results were interesting because I, I talked to people who worked at the drive-in that night and they gave their side of the story. And then some of the people who were at the screening said they saw a tornado rip through the screen and pieces of the screen fly around and and it turns out that didn't actually happen so it, it became this kind of look at memory and how memory can can change over time and and storytelling i think is an important part of that every time everyone would tell the story about this driving experience. They would add on some detail and it would kind of grow over time. And that sort of, um, it, it, it wasn't the thing that led to me coming up with cursed films, but it was the thing that led to shutter reaching out to me. Um, I, a friend of mine, Owen Shiflett, who was at shutter at the time, he contacted me about that idea that they were pitching internally um, I think Robin Jones, who was at Shutter at the time, came up with the concept, and they just brought it to me and asked me what my take would be on that show, and and it was kind of in line with what I did with the Twisted short, just looking mm. at you know these stories, the idea that some of these stories have in some ways like outlived the the uh, legacy of the films and why people believe these things why they want to believe these things and and why they insist on perpetuating these tales hmm yeah that's super interesting i so I, I'm, I'm curious also just from uh like you growing up what kind of films you liked yeah i i liked a lot of horror films i my parents showed me horror films at a very early age probably too young of an age to be watching some of the yeah. things i did um, that's super that's I, super interesting i i'm i'm i have a very similar upbringing as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 just being exposed to like horror films and just like a super young age where you yeah you know you probably shouldn't be watching those things yeah i mean it, it's it's uh ex it feels exciting like it's it's definitely a uh, um fun you know like i was buying i remember buying fangoria and gore zone magazine and my cousin who i was close with uh being too afraid to even look in the magazine so that kind of demonstrated the difference between his parents raising him and mine raising me but um i mean funny enough i one of my earliest memories is seeing twilight zone the movie and it was the opening with Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks. And it's the moment when Dan Aykroyd says, do you want to see something scary? And he turns around and he's got this sort of white wolf man kind of face. Mm -hmm. And I remember that image and being terrified by that. And that I, I actually saw at the Canview Drive-In, which is the, the drive-in that's in Twisted. And so there's a weird connection there. And then it turns out that the person who did the makeup for that creature is Craig Reardon, who I ended up interviewing in our Poltergeist episode and have uh, become friends with. So, yeah, my 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 movie watching as a kid was was very, you know, a lot of horror, a lot of genre stuff, action movies, and the occasional weird sort of, you know, I wasn't afraid of horror movies, really, but I do remember being terrified of 
um, the day after, which is the Nicholas Meyer nuclear war <laughs> TV series, miniseries. Um, those were the kinds of things that scared me. Tornadoes scared me from the Wizard of Oz. So a weird kid, very weird kid. <laughs> hmm. What what other films made a big impression on you at that young age? Um, I, I think John Carpenter's films were probably the hmm. the uh, the movies that made the biggest impression because it was the first time I remember connecting the dots that oh the the same person made all of these films and mm. you know it would come down to the music sounding similar he yeah. would cast a lot of the same people uh the font in his opening titles was the same on a lot of his films so i you know my parents would be renting things like the thing and big trouble in little china and they live in prince of darkness and I would be seeing that common thread throughout all of those movies. And I think that sort of opened my eyes to this idea of there being a director behind all of this and, you know, a, a, a style that runs through all of these films. So I, I think that was an important part of my, my uh, formative movie watching years. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense because, I mean, John Carpenter also... I mean, he highly designs his movies. He also creates the music for, I think, all of the all of his films. Is that correct? All uh, except a couple. There are only a few that he didn't. The thing Ennio Morricone did the score, but he's basically doing a John Carpenter score. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I remember those formative years where you re you recognize that oh, there's like one person. I mean, not, not one person behind the whole film, but, you know, there's like a, a leader for the film and remembering that, you know, this person has their own footprint that goes throughout the entire production. I think that's kind of like a enlightening experience, especially, especially at like such a young age. Yeah. And I, I, it, it certainly helped that he had his name above the title on the majority of his films. You know, it was always That's John true. Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter's yeah. They Live. Um, so that, that I made that connection pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. And what made you want to become a filmmaker? Uh, I, I think so. I, I was making, films like little goofy short movies when i was probably starting around 13 like the kind of things that kids that age would make a lot of uh action figure <laughs> you know movies little short starring action figures um right up to uh the the standard friday the 13th you know, remake with, if you have access to a goalie mask, then you've got your Friday the 13th outfit. Um, so lots of, lots of fun movie making with friends. And I think that just came out of watching so many films with my, my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my dad was always, um, kind of, uh, he's, was a blue collar, guide worked in construction and factories and foundries and so on and so forth but he always had that sort of artistic side of him that he would be um uh, exploring on the side and i think that kind of rubbed off on me and i as a kid would always be drawing or <clears throat> making models or whatever it might be and i think that just all kind of came to like it led towards filmmaking because it's just a, a combination of so many different um, forms. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you ever thought about having a pre-career retrospective? Of uh, <laughs> like my, <laughs> it's funny, actually today um, we have a Patreon account for Film Junk, my podcast, uh -huh. and <laughs> there's a, a store in, in my hometown called That's Entertainment. That's a, one of the last remaining video stores. And of course I worked there as a, a teen 
And we made a movie in, in the store after hours and we uh, just put it up on our Patreon, Patreon account in like incredible. in honor of the that. store closing. So um, that reminds yeah, me I of mean, uh, that reminds me of that film. Be kind. Rewind. Do you remember that? Film? Yeah. Yeah. Or kind of, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm really attracted. I think that's also why I'm kind of attracted to the cursed films stories. But I, I love um, stories about people making things um, and, you know, just ex really passionate people trying to overcome whatever challenges they face when trying to, you know, reach some sort of artistic outcome. And one of my favorite films of all time is American movie, this documentary about, um, that's exactly what I was going to bring up actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. C continue. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was uh, just thinking about that. Uh huh. Mark Borchard trying to make his horror film, um, called Coven, um, <laughs> which he pronounces that way. Cause coven rhymes with oven. And, um, <laughs> he him and his friends just coming together to try to make this horror film and looking at all the the challenges that they face and it's just such a a heartwarming story because everyone around him understands his passion and they all want to see him succeed and they all take the time out of their day to be extras in his movie and help him in whatever ways he needs and and it's just a really inspiring film um and anything like that like be kind rewind kind of feels like it's in that same space um yeah. even though it's a, a scripted film but stories of people making you know be, being creative like makers making things my, my first documentary beauty day is basically that kind of story um it's about a a guy who named ralph zavadil who had a cable access show in my hometown called cat and video um, the Captain Video Show, and mm -hmm. it was kind of like a a proto jackass. So he would do skits and stunts, and um, you know have these wild things of him jumping off of his roof, and you know just very early jackass kind of stuff, snorting yeah. eggs, and and uh, <laughs> I grew up with that show, and and I eventually connected with him and made this feature documentary about him making that show and then you know 15 years later trying to make a 20th anniversary of of the show and documenting his creative process and it was just right up my alley i mean that's the kind of hmm. stuff that inspires me and i with making documentaries i just love getting the chance to spend so much time with like-minded people uh creative people sense. yeah 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 that makes sense too i mean it seems like it's kind of like championing the this this childlike spirit and yeah. being able although uh that I haven't seen that uh documentary um that you did yet but it's that sounds kind of dangerous you know like <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. if you're doing these jackass kind of stunts like 20 years down the line um but I but I think the point is is just this idea of like um, recently I read this book, I'm bringing this author on the podcast. Her name is Lydia Yuknovich and she wrote this book called the misfits manifesto. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's basically talking about, um, well, I guess, I, I suppose it's, it's to sum it up. It's like talking about just the feeling of wanting to be seen and wanting to be heard, you know, and that could be on a communal level. And, you know, she likens people that live on the outside and, as uh or cat you know uh parts of counterculture as these misfits right right and um and i don't know i think there's something beautiful especially you know working in film about thinking of i mean you know there's multiple reasons why people get drawn into wanting to work on films but um i believe at the end of the day it's like wanting to be seen and this sort of camaraderie Right. Like that would keep you involved and in wind the film to, you know, contribute to films. Yeah. Like I was listening to this interview with Gary Oldman and he was just talking about how, you know, he just loves to come to set and, um, and be able to work with his friends. Right. And it mm -hmm. just seems like that's where the heart is at the end of the day. 
maybe not for all people, right? It's hard to pin down like a universal truth among a universal psychological truth among people. But, you know, if you bring it back to like the, the childlike spirit, it, it seems more pure in a way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it's interesting. Cause I, I feel like there are some actors that, you know, you question some of the decisions they make in their career and they end up making a lot of films that are like, I'm thinking of maybe Robert De Niro, you know, late career, Robert De Niro doing a lot of video on demand style action movies or, or, um, you know, Eddie Murphy going down this sort of family friendly, um, comedy path and, and people make judgments towards that based purely on the output, like the quality of the output of that process. But I feel like there's probably something there for a lot of those people that just, they just want to keep working and keep being surrounded by their crews and being creative with, with groups of people and whether or not the outcome is, you know, some groundbreaking piece of cinema is, is not necessarily the main goal. It, it, the main goal might just be that, that family, um, that crew. Yeah. Which, um, which I think I, we kind of touched on in season two of cursed films with our serpent in the rainbow episode, which found, you know, the crew going to Haiti kind of in this naive, uh, pursuit of, you know, being the first American film crew to, to film in Haiti and then facing all of these challenges that they didn't expect. And it kind of bringing them closer together. Um, it kind of demonstrates the, I think the, yeah, that, that sort of community of the, the film crew and everyone coming together to make something creative. I think of Ed Wood, you know, like the, especially Tim Burton's film about Ed Wood, that feeling of everyone on his crew is a sort of misfit. And this is their common goal to make this movie. And it doesn't matter if it's garbage, you know, it's yeah. about the process. Totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy for someone on the outside to make a judgment on, you know, Robert De Niro, for instance. It's like, why aren't you making Taxi Driver like 30 years later, 40 years later? Yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of easy for someone to make that judgment. But sometimes I think the pursuit of uh, artistic viability can make people crazy too. You know, this mm -hmm. sort of need for control. So it's like, um, and I'm also, you know, just speaking in general, but, you know, it, it's easy for someone to judge, like, why do you, why are you making meet the parents, right? Like, why don't you just continue to make a ta another taxi driver or something like that, right? It's just e an easy judgment, yeah. right? But I like yeah. um, the Serpent and the Rainbow episodes that you brought it up, um, for instance, because it, it confronts this idea of Western hubris. Yep. In a lot of ways, right? And um, and I, I was also just thinking of, uh, like in the episode, it talks about these spiritual awakenings and this kind of come to consciousness uh, with a lot of the actors. And um, something about that made it seem like it wasn't cursed in a way. Um, although there's you know many details to it, but in terms of the way that the actors came together in that familial way I thought was really profound. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I think that's kind of the strange thing with this show is the cursed films title is sort of a bait and switch. Like it's not really the, the, I, th I think some people might land on this series expecting something closer to a, an E true Hollywood story or something you'd find on the travel channel or, and the hope is that it's, it's a little, it digs a little deeper than that and is focused more on the interview subjects, the characters and um, providing context to all of these sometimes horrible things that have happened and exploring why we're, we're interested in these stories to begin with. And, um, yeah, the Serpent and the Rainbow episode is a great example of landing on the final thought of it actually being blessed in a way because 
you know, they, they faced these challenges that, you know, they kind of should have maybe known better. <laughs> um, they kind of landed in this situation that they created for themselves, but they got out of there without any serious, you know, uh, injuries or damages or what have you. And the thought being that part of the reason for that is because they were actually blessed. They went to a voodoo ceremony at the beginning of the production so that the um, the crew could be blessed and have this uh, smooth experience of shooting this movie. So it's really, you know, kind of like a glass half empty or full sort of thing. And <laughs> yeah. um, with curses, you know, it, I, I feel like the title, the title kind of for some people might demand some sort of supernatural event or, you know, something that that points towards a curse in that sort of way. That's that's sort of like literal someone cursed this production or it brought up dark forces because of the subject matter. But sometimes it's just everything is going wrong and you just feel you just stand back and say that it feels like this is cursed, <laughs> you know, like just everything is going wrong and how can we possibly overcome this? And that's where it's, it gets interesting is finding out how they overcame those, those problems, or in some cases yeah. maybe didn't overcome those problems. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, just speaking about curses in general, but how do you think that idea of a curse has changed for you over the course of working on this series? Uh, I, I think thinking about curses as, you know, I, I don't believe in the ability to curse someone from a supernatural sort of angle, I guess. But yeah. I do believe, I, I guess I came out of this believing that if someone does believe that and they feel that they've been cursed, then it could work on them because it could affect their judgment or, you know, that sort of self-fulfilling prophecy side of things that ultimately would affect their, like we, we talk about um, the uh, Red Sox jersey buried in Yankee Stadium as being something that they had to dig out because they were worried that it would curse the, the stadium. And while it seems ridiculous, I think there's an element of that sort of classic sports, um, uh, you know, like I need my lucky hat or I need my, the superstitions connected to sports that can affect even on a micro level, the performance of an athlete, if they're even remotely unsettled or unfocused by this thought. And that's interesting because it, it kind of suggests that curses are real, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. as long as the person who believes in it, um, is like really playing the part and allowing it to take over, um, their, their life, then the curse worked. Um, so I, I think that's been kind of an interesting perspective coming out of this. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting to think about because you also think about the idea of placebo effects as well. And I feel like that falls into it. Although yeah. placebo effects generally talk about like a curing of some sort of, um, disease or, right. Yeah. Well, we, we, in our exorcist episode, we filmed, uh, we spent a day with a r quote unquote real exorcist and filmed him performing an exorcism on, I think we filmed five people hmm. and it was, uh, one of the most kind of depressing <laughs> days of filming that I've ever had. Um, How so? just watching people who are who are th their problems run a lot deeper than mm -hmm. um this person can handle and you know this person was a, a ex uh furniture salesman who became a, a mm -hmm. an exorcist and you know people pay him good money to um relieve them of whatever problems they're having and some of it is just like, you know, uh, 
money problems. Like I'm not, I, I haven't, I'm struggling financially. I need an exorcism. And then on the other end of that spectrum is someone who is struggling with gender identity and they feel that that's some sign of some demonic presence. So they seek out an exorcist to help them repress whatever feelings they're having. And there were a couple of those that day and it was gross, <laughs> you know, like it just felt really, felt really, um, uh, manip manipulative and, um, but also interesting in the way that, cause the, the whole reason we filmed it is this idea of the movie, the exorcist resulting in this increase of exorcisms because it became part of the, the zeitgeist. It came, became this pop culture moment and perpetuated this idea of, um, the exorcism and thinking about horror films as, um, uh, we, we interviewed someone who talked about horror films as sort of a uh, missionary tool that the exorcist actually works in favor of the Catholic church because it confirms that the devil is real. And, you know, the, the um, only thing that can defeat it are these two priests and, and that sort of message stuck and people were suddenly seeking out exorcists to deal with, things that probably should be dealt with by a therapist. And yeah. that was what we witnessed that day to the point of one of the, one of them being interrupted and having to have a conversation with the person uh, essentially saying to them that I, I, we're not going to use this footage and that she should seek um, help Professional elsewhere. Help. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was an intense day. Wow. But um, an interesting one for sure. Hmm. And a very real one. It, that's kind of the weird thing with this show as well is, you know, the experience of that day from our perspective is very different from the audience's perspective, which I think a lot of people are just like, why is this in here? This, this is, these are obviously actors. This is fake. This is, you know, um, and that's kind of the point is, you know, that that episode ends on one of the, the people that, you know, had an exorcism done just counting out hundred dollar bills to this guy, which he didn't expect to happen and kind of tried to <laughs> stop from happening in front of the camera. And, um, it was that sort of, uh, you know, um, predatory capitalism or, or, you know, yeah, that predatory feeling of we just watched someone be taken advantage of specifically when we were told that nobody was going to be paying for anything that we witnessed. Um, hmm. So, yeah, that's it, so it, it was interesting. interesting. No, yeah. it's so interesting just, just to speak of just predatory capitalism in general. I mean, like even in the stalker episode, it's so bizarre that, I mean, you guys went to Chernobyl and there's like a, an ice cream parlor or an ice cream stand or something. And then there is mm -hmm. also like um, a lot of tourism, Chernobyl tourism, right? Yeah. And how this idea of the stalker infiltrates the Chernobyl zone, which, you know, the zone is also in stalker and how it's almost like a, a weird, like archaeological psychological study of of human psychology in a in a way right it's yeah just, yeah it's very strange yeah. <clears throat> it, it's a weird thing because it's like that it, it felt like there was a desperation to turn this place into something you know where they could make money off of bringing tourists and and the only way they could do it is attach the term stalker to things like there was a stalker bar and grill <laughs> like food truck there and, um, so and it had an ad advertisement for a stalker hostel and this word is just everywhere and yeah it makes me think like well what are they referring to are, i i don't believe that they're referring to the film they might be they might be referring to the video game stalker, which is also referring to the film. It's this weird, like kind of, uh, you know, um, 
journey that this word takes and ultimately ends up being some piece of advertising. And you wonder, well, do the people who are using this as advertising even know where it came from? And the people who are who it's advertising to, do they even know what it means? Like, it's very weird. But then, as you said, there's also the just the blunt like stalker or uh, Chernobyl ice cream. And we had we ate at the the power plant, um, the Chernobyl mm. plant. And how was that? They had a, it was uh, interesting. I mean, it, it's just like uh, it was a cafe, like a cantina. And a lot of um, it felt very pretty standard. But um, the weird thing is just knowing where you are. You know, like you, oh, it, yeah. it feels very normal, but it is not normal. And then leaving the place, there's a little kiosk with um, souvenirs, and they sell coffee there. And the coffee cups say "Fuel Your Active Zone Chernobyl Coffee" or whatever. Like it's just surreal. It's it's strange. Um, but a, an experience that it was an amazing experience. And, and the weird thing is there is that tourist side of it, but, but the actual, um, tour is not like easy, you know, like it's, it, it's not something that's like tourist friendly. Um, it's not as hard as it is, you know, we were going to go in with a illegally with a stalker and it would have meant 32 hours of just in total, uh, walking and filming and it, we just couldn't do it. But, um, there's, there's a lot of walking, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uncomfortable situations. And we slept in Chernobyl in the, the town Chernobyl. Um, and the accommodations obviously are very, um, what you would imagine. And it's all, it all makes for an amazing experience, but I can't see like, someone going there, you know, as thinking that they're going to be going to like universal studios or something. Um, Yeah. That's, yeah, that's really, that's really fascinating. Yeah. And I remember you were talking about that. Actually, I was listening to another podcast and you were saying that you guys were going to go in illegally with a stalker, but it would take, you know, that a long period of time, but he, essentially gave you a lot of his accumulated GoPro and, and prosumer um, grade uh, footage and which actually worked nicely with the tone of the whole piece. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think it is better. I mean, we would have went in there and followed him and it would have felt like the other footage following the, the official tour. Um, but with that sort of immediate, um, feel of like a really shaky low res, uh, camera contrasted up against the, our cameras documenting the official tour, I think ultimately it was a, a better result. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that. Um, so I did want to ask about just the production in general, so do you think that uh, the production was cursed at all? Um, well, we, so we have had, obviously COVID was a, a big challenge for this season. Our, our first season, we looked back on that and thought how, you know, we took for granted the ability to just travel freely and enter people's homes without the concern of, of um, COVID and taking tests and wearing masks and face shields and everything. So, you know, it was a very different vibe on this season. And um, I think also we, we, we just kind of weirdly between season one and two had a lot of, like I personally um, a month before the first season aired, I lost my dad to lung cancer unexpectedly with like a very short two month, hmm. um, battle with that. Wow. And then a couple months later, lost an uncle, um, unexpectedly a couple months later, my cat died in bed beside me a couple months later, my dad's 
best childhood friend also got lung cancer and he just passed away a, a couple few months ago. So it, it you know, and um, you watch the show and you see there are a number of um, in memory of cards at the end of some of the episodes. Yeah. And, you know, I, it doesn't necessarily um, point to a curse for me, but it it does sort of reveal that that sort of um, draw to want to, you know, make all of those connections. And, and you know, even if it's, it, it's a f- affected me personally and my producer, Brian, lost his dad also from lung cancer, um, you know, half a year after my dad or a year after. And um, so you can't help but think, <laughs> like, it's very strange that all of those things happened after having released this show and spent so much time hearing people talk about other horrible things that have happened and attempt to make all of these connections and make sense of all of it. And I, I think there's, it, it just revealed a, a, that's a very powerful thing, you know, to, to, um, to accept that people can be gone in an instant and, it be completely like seemingly random um, is a hard thing to wrap your head around. And, and um, just the fact that we're talking about now, like the idea of it being strange that all of those things happened after making a film or a series about similar events connected to other productions um, suggests that there's a, um, um, maybe not a need, but an interest in, in trying to explain things in a way that is, is a little more, um, I guess a little more, it's, it's not as <laughs> scary or simple as just someone being gone, you know? Yeah. Um, I think, multiple I think we're people, always, Oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say multiple people being gone, you know, in a short period of time, all ser- like with this th- this sort of weird vibe of this series lingering over it where every time something happens it's like man I, I, it's weird that this is happening and it just keeps happening um yeah it's strange mm. hmm. first of all i'm really sorry to hear about all of those losses i mean that's really terrible um Thanks. Yeah. It, and then of course, COVID happening right after that. So there's, there's just a lot of stuff that, that happened and, um, I yeah. can see how people want to make those connections for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure what the reason is, but I feel like we're always trying as humans, just trying to rationalize different events occurring right and yeah um or trying to make sense out of it in a in a way and sometimes sometimes there are rational reasons for things occurring and then other times it could just happen for no, for no reason right but that that's also kind of the thesis of uh or what i believe you know to be the thesis of of a cursed film is to understand the things that happen around it um, or within the production of the film that, and that, and that's also why, you know, I like that you give context to things that happen adjacent politically, for instance, in stalker and the serpent and the rainbow and also in uh, wizard of Oz, you know, that was the dawn of world war two and just giving yeah. more, you know, as opposed to like you were saying, like a an e true Hollywood story sort of a thing, it gives more layers, and it doesn't try to paint this picture that's just one note, right? It's like this film is cursed yeah. because of this, this, and this. It's like, well, maybe or perhaps like I mean, even Bill Pullman was talking about him. He he seemed like he didn't really want to talk about it at first, but. Um, about him, I, I believe it. He was he got possessed or something like that. Or he went to a ceremony and had some sort of like possession 
sort of thing happening. Yeah, he, right? he, he was very, he didn't talk very specifically about it because like yeah, you said, I he see. didn't really I want see. to, but, yeah. but he had some sort of out-of-body experience, like a clairvoyance, he claims. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the context is, is the important thing. I think when, you know, I agree. hitting yeah. on that is because it, the show is there's, it's definitely in some ways a provocation, you know, it's like, we're, we're going to, I think actually in our cannibal Holocaust episode, there's a remark about cannibal Holocaust that kind of applies to our show to a degree where, um, Eugenio, one of our inter interview subjects talks about how cannibal Holocaust both kind of, um, points the finger at you for enjoying this violence on the screen but also has this message buried within that you know like um this whole are we the can who are the real cannibals like you you shouldn't be enjoying this sort of uh th these visuals and this grotesque violence but we're also going to offer it to you to enjoy it you know like so that we can make mm. that point um so it's kind of a messy a messy uh um process i guess like it, with our show we have to we talk about these curses we're talking about the idea of in some cases it may be being tasteless to you know uh talk about the death of someone in and about a curse in the same you know conversation but we are also that's part of the show so it, it is kind of a weird um um gray area and the, the the only thing that we can do to i think make that work or make it be of any sort of value is provide context and allow the people who who were involved to talk honestly in whatever way they want to about what they think occurred and whether or not they think there was anything unusual or unexplainable about it and more often than not that results in some really fascinating conversations from people who maybe have not had the chance to talk about these things honestly and have been guided in some of their other interviews to lean into the spookiness of what was happening or you know our show is wanting the, you know, to really explore the creepiness. So can you lean into that? That's not what we do. We, we are the opposite of that on our show. It's just, you know, tell us whatever you, you, uh, about whatever you experience and how you feel about that. And then their tone ultimately dictates the tone of the episode. If it's playful, then the, the episode ends up being playful. If it's dark and haunted, then, the episode feels dark and haunted. Um, hmm. So it's, it, I think it's very important to allow the subjects to kind of guide that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And that's why I also like that interview with Steve Rash in the Wizard of Oz episode, because mm -hmm. I feel like he's talking about his career as a whole. Because a lot of the, you know, he's in like American Pie and like bring it on and stuff. And I, I feel like he's reflecting on a lot of things and yeah and the wizard of oz um or I, I under the rainbow rather it was the one of the films that since he was getting interviewed for at the time it's like he's kind of speaking about his whole career in general yeah i i think i mean that interview was interesting because the way he talks about that film was not what we were expecting he was yeah he was going to talk just generally about the idea of that film perpetuating the the story of the drunk munchkins terrorizing the Culver Hotel. Um, and he also said he was going to talk a little bit about weird things that happened while making his film. But when we got there, he and his wife had just watched it for the first time in a number of years. And yeah. re almost seemingly regretted <laughs> agreeing to talk about it because yeah. they were um, surprised at, as he says in the interview, how um, out of touch it is. And uh, so that, that was an interesting interview because that's what that ended up being about, <laughs> you know, like we yeah. showed up there yeah. they were like, okay, let's do this. But, you know, we just watched this thing and we don't want, to, you know, this is how, what we think of it now. 
and again, to the point I was saying before, rather than being, you know, saying, oh, well, we, we want you to talk about just this cursed side of, you know, like the, the Munchkin story and everything. Instead, we just, you know, I would encourage him to talk honestly about his thoughts on that film. And that ultimately ends up being more valuable to us into the episode because thematically it's rich when putting it up against the Oz historians who are having trouble um, accepting this idea of it being a problematic production uh, and, you know, rationalizing Victor Fleming slapping Judy Garland and because they're protective of, of the legacy of the film and the legacy of, of Judy. So they're, they're, not willing to go there. Um, but Steve was, you know, he hmm. immediately was ready to just kind of honestly say, look, this film is, is, uh, tasteless. Well, and, and that's what I also like too, is that you're not presenting a one note sort of story or not. Um, you're not trying to guide someone along to feel a specific way. Right. And mm -hmm. in the Wizard of Oz episode, you bring up the fact of, you know, Judy Garland getting addicted to um, amphetamines and peps, right? And, you know, and you also show that she was a product of this, um, the factory that is Hollywood, right? Which happened to yeah. a lot of women during that time period. And um, I think that that's a very good. I mean, it's a very, it's a very relevant topic to very relevant topic to bring up, you know, because um, that's exactly what happened, you know. I mean, Victor yeah. Fleming slapping Judy Garland, and every, I mean, you know, like that would never happen today. But yeah, um, you would at least not hope on it set. Doesn't. <laughs> oh yeah, you yeah you hope it wouldn't wouldn't happen. Yeah, I mean, mm. but I think like you know, back in the late thirties. Uh, that behavior was, I guess, okay. Uh, yeah, it's funny. It's it, it's like also complex because you know we talked to Lorna Luft, Judy Garland's daughter, and mm, yeah. it's not like she was just like, yeah, they everyone treated my mother like shit, and it's their fault that she went down this path, and she doesn't talk about it as in in such. A, a binary way like she's very you know she acknowledges that the studio had a, a negative effect but then she always kind of goes back to but they didn't know what they were doing so mm. even from her you know it, like it would be very a, a much cleaner conversation if she just took a very solid stance and was like yeah you know victor fleming was abusive um the studio mm -hmm. took advantage. This all led to my mother's addiction problems and my own addiction problems. And but she talks about it the way she wants to talk about it, which is, yeah, all of that stuff happened and it did have a negative effect. But she also is is kind of just placing it in that era in a similar way that some of the the historians do. Um, and it's her mother, <laughs> you know, like yeah. she, she, so, you know, like so I know sometimes with the reaction to these episodes, some, there will be some kind of um, impulsive reactions or emotional reactions to the, the men talking about Victor Fleming slapping Judy and, and, you know, brushing it off as though it's nothing. The interesting thing is Lorna Luff did the same thing. <laughs> like it's, it's not in the episode because she's, introduced later but she also said it was just a slap it was a little slap and it's it's just it, it just kind of reveals how complicated some of these conversations are and i kind of like to allow them to be complicated and i think it's more interesting and it kind of asks the viewer to do a little more work to decide what how they feel and I mean, sometimes it, it, you know, sometimes I worry that we're, we're like using a, a sledgehammer on a nail with this because it's like, it's a show about cursed films. It's called cursed films. <laughs> People just want to see 
you know, there's a large chunk of the audience that just wants to see people reiterating rumors they heard or read on BuzzFeed. And that's it. They don't <laughs> want anything deeper or like don't yeah. want to have to think about anything else. But I'm not interested in that as a filmmaker. And I, I hope yeah. that, um, you know, for every person who might be confused about whatever tangent or, or weird thing we talk about that might be a little more subtextual, um, there might be a person out there that gets it and, and kind of is surprised by, um, mm -hmm. by that, you know, from a, a show called cursed films. Yeah. I mean, I think you guys had a really good balance of making it entertaining, but then also, you know, adding more context into the situations and creating a more complex dialogue as opposed to just spoon feeding your audience. Yeah, I, I hope so. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I mean, sometimes it's, uh, I mean, like for, for example, the Rosemary's baby episode is a very challenging one because of Polanski and, yeah. you know, I, there were, there was some response from viewers who were upset that there was, there, there were so many people talking about Polanski as being a genius and there was no mention of his uh, history and, you know, the, uh, the statutory rape of um, uh, this minor, which now has him living in Europe. And yeah. <clears throat> I get that. And I, I think that's also a, a little bit kind of part of the provocation of the show is, you know, this story, that story is about 1968, 1969. And at that time, everyone thought he was a genius and that was mm. it. And I almost feel like exiting that episode with just that perspective on Polanski, knowing uh, where his his career and his life Would went, yeah. um, is is more that absence of that is more powerful than throwing a card up or having someone mention it in a soundbite that ultimately wouldn't give it the, 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 the time it deserves or trying to connect that event to a curse. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a messy, it, it can be a messy thing. Like documentaries can be messy because the, the, th what you don't want to do is exploit people, but on sure. a very basic level, you are exploiting people because you're <laughs> you're you're taking their stories and you're putting them out there and you're creating these uh, films and series and and some have more value than others, but it is a, a very base level ex exploitation. The only thing that can balance that is that context, I think, and and some empathy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I think you guys do that really well, uh, especially given the subject matter. Um, I was, I was curious actually, since we're talking about the Rosemary's baby episode is, you know, that interview that you had with Diane Lake, the former Manson family member. Yeah. And I was wondering, well, I, first of all, I was wondering how you got her to, um, to be on that episode, but then also what you found personally, like the most intriguing about that interview. Um, my producer, Brian, reached out to her. I, I think he reached out to her book agent or because she wrote a book about her experience. And I think it came out within a year of us interviewing her. So mm. it was kind of, you know, it worked out for her in that regard. Um, but I mean, it was just such a an interesting conversation because she's you look at her and it, it, you don't see Manson family member. <laughs> um, some of the things that came out of her mouth about, you know, her experiences with Charles Manson and, you know, it, it's just a harrowing childhood because she was 14 when she ended up with them and she yeah. was, you know, raped by Charles Manson. She has this insane history and it's just um, wild hearing her talk about that and, and you know, the, the distance between that event and where she is now. Um, it, it's just a, a very surreal thing. 
so yeah, I mean, it, it, in terms of, um, you know, what I, I got from that interview that was, that I found fascinating, I, I think just hearing, and, and of course we couldn't put this all in the show, but just hearing someone lay out the way in which they can become, can find themselves in essentially a, a, a cult, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it, the, the way she laid it out, it, it kind of is like, okay, that, yeah, I get it. Like your parents were, were hippies. They, they didn't really care what you did. You, you, uh, were emancipated from them at an early age. You ended up traveling to San Francisco, met this group of people who are very friendly and kind. And it, it, you know, the, the way she laid it out, it was like, you know, I, I would be a Manson family member. Like it was, it just made sense. But of course yeah. it takes this crazy turn. And as soon as it does, she feels trapped and it's, it's an amazing story. Um, and getting to hear it directly from someone who experienced it was, was, uh, yeah, it was, it was wild. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's really that's really interesting. Yeah. I was, I was just thinking about that. I was like, because she seems so forthcoming about speaking about the, the murders and about, um, you know, after I forget who, what, what her name was, um, or, you know, the group that went and killed Sharon Tate and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was talking about how they came back to the, to the ranch and then, how you know they were bragging about uh killing you know killing them and i was like oh my god like that's i don't know it's just it's just crazy to think about that that whole occurrence yeah and i mean she's she's obviously uh told those stories a number of times and has written a book about it and you know that's part of the challenge as well is trying to get something out of an interview where maybe someone has talked about something um, <clears throat> quite a bit and, and trying to get an angle on it. That's not yeah. well represented. And and with the Rosemary's baby episode, like the Manson murders, as we kind of say in, in the show, it's like the, the biggest kind of true crime story that people are obsessed with. And I think have heard almost every single, um, angle or seen every angle, heard every story connected to it. But I think there were just some interesting things that we, even if it's just hearing voices that maybe you haven't heard, like Julian Wasser, the photographer who Polanski yeah. brought up to Cielo Drive with him to take pictures of the the house after the the crime. That ex- him talking about that as well is is wild, and going up to Cielo Drive with him and and him remembering being there that day, and um, it, it's a. Uh, you really sense that history when you're in that, that environment. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty crazy hearing him talking about the, I the smell. Yeah. You know, because it was still, they didn't clean up the, cl- the crime scene and then like the smell of blood and flesh. And then also, uh, the, the phone had, um, a handprint on it and him taking yeah. a photo of um, the the phone and how Polanski was like looking through, I, I believe it was their wedding album or something like that. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And, um, and yeah. the interesting thing with Julian is, you know, we start off with him talking about being a, a crime scene photographer. Uh, you know, it's, even as a kid starting out uh, taking pictures of these horrible crime scenes and he kind of yeah. gleefully describes what he thinks makes a, a great crime photo and essentially it comes down to whatever is gruesome. And with setting him up like that and then getting to the point of him being in that home and taking pictures and having hearing him say he felt like a um, completely, you know... Um, uh, overcome by the like the smell, as you said, and and like he was just taking pictures of Polanski, and he felt like he was uh, it was inappropriate, and it was the fact that it got to him in that way after we've heard him 
talk about his his history with taking photos of horrific crime scenes i think suggests yeah. the power of that that scene as well and the weird the weird side of polanski bringing a psychic up there gosh yeah yeah i don't know that yeah that whole scene is like really strange <laughs> to say the least yeah I, I think it all it's all summed up when julian is looking across the valley at the new mansion that was built in place of the Polanski mm. home and and says this is la access to the nth degree and it felt like the whole <laughs> episode was was that summed up yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely just that los angeles opulence mm-hmm. I, I also like how you uh, how uh, in that episode too, you added in the uh, what 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 was the um, Cielo Drive was a uh, uh, a street off of the main street Benedict Canyon. Yeah, like all of the murders and all of the things that happened in Benedict Canyon. Yeah, I thought that was really fascinating too. Yeah, it's Scott Michaels. He's uh, <clears throat> the one who lists all of those off and he's just like a walking encyclopedia for that kind of history and yeah. uh, he started talking about all of those i remember in the interview and i i said that was great scott can you tell me all of that again at twice the speed <laughs> and then he just <laughs> yeah listed them off and i knew right then that it, that that was going to be a a crazy montage um oh, it was but it yeah. is it is wild it just you know suggests that weird history like of course people living on that on any street there's going to be people who die <laughs> of course yeah. um but the names connected to it and the ways in which you know the tragic ways in which many of them died it's it feels like a very dark place yeah yeah no definitely um i did want to ask specifically about cannibal holocaust and i have to <laughs> i have to make this comment that um i was about to eat lunch when i started the cannibal holocaust episode and i i, I don't know why i thought that that was appropriate like i was like oh yeah and no, i'm just gonna eat lunch and watch this and then the first scene that comes on is like i, I i'm assuming it's cow, a cow brain is that correct yeah I, I think it's a a cow or a lamb maybe it might be a lamb yeah, um, and it's I'm this, not sure. I, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's this huge hunk of brain, <laughs> and <laughs> like the the butcher or the chef or whatever is cutting through it, and I'm just sitting there, like, and you know, I, I well, you don't know, but um, I'm mostly vegan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't really eat meat, and I'm just sitting there watching this big hunk of flesh fleshy brain matter like getting chopped through and i'm like oh man i can't i can't do this while i eat so i i I had to switch it but yeah um the main thing that i want to ask is uh and correct me if i'm not pronouncing his name right but ruggiero diodato the director ruggiero yeah ruggiero ruggiero diodato okay so what was it like interviewing him uh it was I, it was great because he's so open and honest. So, it, you know, that's always a, a a great interview because you feel like you can ask them anything. And uh, mm-hmm. the, the challenge, of course, is that he's speaking in Italian and I, I oh, had an yeah, yeah. uh, interpreter there. So it's not as much of a... I like my interviews to be conversational. So, you know, I... I don't bring question like a, a list of questions. I don't have the the thing where I ask people to restate in a, you know their que- answer in a sentence or whatever, which always yeah, throws sure. people off. Like restate my question in their answer. Um, I just you know <laughs> yeah. I, I just we start talking, and that's why a lot of our interviews are really long because um, I usually talk about things that aren't necessarily related to what we're discussing for about 15 minutes to get them warmed up and then we start getting that into things sense. and with with Ruggiero I think that interview was five hours long and Holy part of that crap. is because of because of the uh interpretation the but uh, I see it also was just 
a long interview. <laughs> he had a lot to say. Yeah. And um, he was he was interesting because he was, you could sense that uh, the energy that people talk about having experienced coming from him on the set, you could sense a little bit of that during the interview. Like he he showed up and immediately was uh, complaining about the restaurant that it wasn't a fancy enough restaurant for him to be interviewed in and what? uh that's so you know, strange w- was talking about how he wished that we did it at his home and uh he was never rude to us like it, it was more he was directing all of this weird uh frustration towards the people that helped us arrange this that they didn't give him the proper information so, mm-hmm. you know, we, we could sense that. <laughs> it's just like very, uh, I don't know. Once he got going, it was fine, but it, it felt like we had to kind of work him up to like, no, Roger, this is great. You look great. This is going to be uh, a great interview. You're giving us good stuff. And once it got going, it was fine. And he would always check in and ask like, are they getting what they want? Am I, mm. you know, are they, are they happy? And, um, we were happy <laughs> and yeah you know he's he's just a a character he's he's uh, i think that whole episode is full of characters and that time that f- 5 days in rome um having those types of conversations over and over were it was pretty intense oh of course i mean i i like how you guys end the episode too and where uh, one of the main actors, I forget what his name is at this time, but he, uh, I think you asked him something to the effect of, you know, how would you sum up your experience of being in Cannibal Holocaust? And he just said, awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was a perfect way to end the episode because, I mean, just, you know, thinking about the contrast between the way that the actors speak about uh, Ruggiero and, um, as opposed to like Wes Craven, for instance, like it seemed like everyone loved working with Wes Craven. Right? Yeah. And, and yes, the subject matter is different, but it's just, I don't know. It's just interesting to think of like how important that leader is to a, a film. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a Francesca says something that really hit home, which was, uh, and when talking about the killing of the turtle, Yes, that yeah. it was an it was an abuse because they felt like they were essentially being held captive in the jungle being forced to participate in the slaughter of an animal <laughs> and yeah. you know it it's i can see that like you know you're you're out there you don't as an actor you don't want to disappoint the director but you have carl talks about this a little bit this sort of like you know who am i who you start to question where your ethical line is even though it's it's for a film and it's not real but there are elements of it that are crossing lines and uh especially in that film yeah 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 even for us in doing the episode like the the iconic image from that film is the the girl on the pole impaled on the pole yeah nude and then we discover in the interview that that girl who was raped by these journalists in the scene previous to that was 14. So, you know, then it's like, okay, well, we can't show, we can't show that image. And it becomes a weird thing because the film, like this is for, this show was made for Shudder and the film is on the service. You can, you can watch our episode and then go watch Cannibal Holocaust and see everything that, these people are talking about that we are showing just enough to make the point, but not enough to be, uh, you know, indulge in the images. But it's a very, it was a weird episode because I also felt like I had to push for some of the, you know, the, the intense stuff that, that I think were kind of targeted as maybe things to cut because it just felt too, 
misogynistic or tasteless or whatever, but by not including it, I, I think it was, it would do a disservice to like, for example, Francesca talking about filming yeah. this rape scene with, you know, 10 or 15 extras who aren't really extras because they're just people that they found in, in the Amazon. And, and while she's talking about it being a traumatic experience, Ruggiero is questioning whether or not she experienced pleasure from it. <laughs> it, it it's just like a, yeah. a weird thing. Cause I, you know, I felt like I didn't want to push back on too many things and make the episode just, I didn't want to be an edge Lord. <laughs> you know, like I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be like, this is so dark that, you know, essentially where the film is for a lot of people, which is like a challenge. Like yeah. this film is so fucked up. See if you can sit through it. Um, the episode couldn't, couldn't be that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I went and checked it out because I never have seen that film, but I just skimmed through certain parts to, you know, yeah. get prepared for this episode. But I don't know. I mean, even for me, like, uh, yeah, I mean, have you, have you sat, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you've sat there and watched it, but I mean, it's probably yeah, something I, that you've only watched maybe a hand like once or twice maybe, or do you watch, have you watched a lot? I mean, no, <laughs> um, I'm not a big fan of the cannibal films for, yeah for all of the reasons that cannibal holocaust is a tough watch and <clears throat> i think i've seen it twice i saw it when i was you know younger and just watching whatever horror stuff i could watch and then yeah i for a time years ago i worked at a video game company and there, there would be movie nights and someone on the staff recommended cannibal holocaust we showed up at this movie night and they were the only person that didn't show up <laughs> and we watched it. There was like <laughs> 10, 10 of us and we watched it yeah. and felt so gross afterwards. And, uh, yeah. it felt like we watched porn together or something. It was just, yeah. cause it's not, it obviously the animal killings is, is a big part of that, but it's also like the music, which I love the music. It's, but it's effective in that it's, at times just really like this pulsating synthesizer. It sounds like pornographic and it's set to images that are, are lingered on for a little too long. And it, everything about the movie, it just makes you, makes me feel gross. <laughs> so, yeah. um, the, str the strange thing about that movie too, I mean, just to kind of compare it, so a film that just comes to mind is solo. Yeah. And that movie feels like cannibal Holocaust makes that movie feel like it's like PG 13. Yeah. I, I think, <laughs> you know, again, it's the yeah. context thing. Like the, there's a, yeah. a section where we talk about animal snuff in, in films. And I originally had a longer, um, section in the episode digging into that and the idea of, uh, you know, why animal, the history of animals being killed on film and why we kind of respond in different ways to the, mm. the ways in which the, they're killed. And it's, it's again about the context and looking at like Jean-Luc Godard's weekend where there's a, a pig slaughtered on camera or, um, uh, Tarkovsky's Andre Rublev, where they toss a horse down the stairs and stab it with a spear. Um, mm. These are all horrific things to to look at. But what is it about Cannibal Holocaust that is different? It, you know, it's an animal dying either way. Um, but there's there's something about the way the in Cannibal Holocaust, it's it's lingered on and it's treated as Simon Hobbs says in the episode, like it's treated like a set piece, you know, like ex exploitation films and genre films are often made up of set pieces and the animal killing is just another set piece to linger on. And, um, I think without any real value, um, hmm. outside of that blurring of the lines, which is, I think what makes it work so well like what makes that 
movie feel gross to me. <laughs> you know, like it succeeds on so many levels in that regard. Um, mm. cause you really don't know what's, what's real and what isn't. And you don't know what the intentions are of the filmmakers. And I've said before, it's like when I was a kid watching kiss perform and you look at kiss mm. as a kid and it's like, this is the most evil band on the face of the earth. And they're all Satanists and they, are spitting blood <laughs> on stage yeah. and then it's like oh the person splitting spitting blood is gene simmons and he is like the furthest away from anything uh remotely um dangerous i think uh well maybe in some ways but you know this is the person who had a reality tv show so the 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 facade is uh a powerful one but you know, once you meet the people behind it, it can completely change your perception. And uh, I think talking to Ruggiero, it made sense. Like he was friendly and he was, you know, uh, a fairly normal person, but yeah. you could you could sense his, his um, sadism. <laughs> you know, the, the, when he totally. talks about the yeah. comparing Cannibal Holocaust to the Iraqi beheading video um, that he succeeded because a fan said that his film is worse. I, oh Lord, I know. I remember that. I was like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> like, I was yeah. just, I, I was like flabbergasted. Um, mm -hmm. God, it just—it's just so interesting. I mean, it, and it sounded like a lot of the actors in the film didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. It seemed like the only person that knew what they were get, getting into is Ruggiero. Yeah. I mean, they were kind of, especially Carl who was brought in to replace somebody. So he, he yeah. went down without even having read the script. I know. And that, and so it just kind of, it also brings up this question of desire and wanting to be known. And it's like, at what cost, right? Like being a young actor yeah. and, you know, and not really understanding the context of the thing that you're getting involved in. I mean, Cannibal Holocaust is definitely a, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a special type of, uh, <laughs> of, of film to, you know, have to get or to, to get involved with, but, yeah, it's, I mean, these people that, you know, they want, they want to pursue this career and they're, they're doing like what Lucas says in the episode that they were hungry. They just would kill for a, a part and they end up in this film and then half of them don't want to be associated with it. So course, the, the very yeah. thing that they were hoping to get out of that experience, they're attempting to bury. Um, yeah. I'd see why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I just want to, um, I really want to thank you just for your time and, you know, for doing this. I, I, I appreciate you for, uh, for taking this time. And I was curious, um, do you have any advice for any artists out there, filmmakers, creatives? Um, hmm. I think, um, just being aware. So I, I, you know, on the younger side, I would say just keep making, make as much as you can. And um, obviously, you know, we were talking about the, the short films I made as a kid, which compared to what you can do now <laughs> is insane. Like I, yeah. I was editing VCR to VCR and, you know, uh, putting music in by just taking one of the audio inputs out and putting in a CD player input. So now, <laughs> now you can just, you can make things that are insane. So I think there's a, a great advantage there for younger people to be creative and, and, you know, make things. Um, but as you know, they start to enter that phase where it feels like it's a career that someone might want to pursue it's a very challenging thing to, I think, kind of um, have a voice 
and mm. and work <laughs> you know like not yeah. the, there it's very i think rare that the people like your quentin tarantino's or paul thomas anderson's or these people who have complete control over their output their filmography and their voice um that's that's a tough thing to accomplish and i think you know trying to find some some way to be able to tell your own stories but also um but also deliver something de deliver a promise to those people that are allowing you to do that thing you know like the mm -hmm. people the producers the executives it's it's always a really challenging uh relationship because you you really want to push it in one direction and they're always thinking of the audience and i think ultimately for me yes the audience is a consider consideration but i think i always just think of an audience with my own tastes um you know i i feel like there's a there's been a loss of the film maker or film like the filmmakers uh the directors the writers the the executives who are choosing these projects as curators it, it feels like now the audience is dictating that a lot more um and because of social media and whatnot and you know people being able to create campaigns to have uh sequels made or things uh, uh you know actors replaced or whatever there's just this weird crowdsourcing feeling towards a lot of cinema now i i, I feel like so yeah. so you just have to be aware of that that balance of like not being um um antagonistic or or so much of a uh, a provocateur mm -hmm. towards the with the audience that you know you're you're pushing them away although there are some people at great that are great at doing that um mm -hmm. but also not allowing them to dictate what your voice is uh yeah it, it you know it's it's hard to strike that balance so i would say just be prepared to find whatever clever strategic way you can to maintain your identity and voice throughout whatever work you do even if it's being challenged um and in many ways it, it's challenged in a good way but um yeah i don't i don't know yeah that's helpful <laughs> yeah that's super helpful yeah i think that's super helpful um and i i like that you added for a younger audience and someone who's kind of in their career as a as a, a creative um i think that's incredibly helpful because i think I mean, I think we all need reminders of the reason why we're doing the thing that we're doing, whatever that may be. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of nonfiction books that are dedicated to that, you know, like trying to help p people refine their way or whatever it may be, or even define it. Um, yeah, but, I, I think that's why it's yeah. fun looking at those old, like the thing that we posted today, the old movies and looking at the, a, a time where it was purely just like, let's go out on the weekend and make something for the sake of making it. And the only totally. audience is ourselves when it's finished. Um, yeah. And kind of being reminded of that because I think sometimes in the middle of some of these projects, you lose that you lose sight you can lose sight of that a little bit it just starts to feel like you're you're um on cruise control and and just trying to get you know everything in the can and delivered um you can't let that happen i think you have to try to continually maintain some sort of vision and voice and perspective and i think that's what makes your work stand out and that's ultimately yeah. what why people want to hire you i mean there are a lot of technicians out there that can make shows that look really great but it's that it's that particular vision that you might have or that that sense of visuals combined with music and the types of stories you want to tell and the characters that you want to explore that's what i'm talking about with the the 
idea of the filmmaker as a curator. Like I'm, I'm going to find these things that I find interesting and share them with you. Um, you know, it's more of like a, a DJ as an artist versus a wedding DJ. <laughs> There's a lot of, I think, mm-hmm. filmmakers that are, yeah. are wedding DJs and they're just playing the hits. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, a lot yeah, just more remixing, the, remixing the hits essentially. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trying, trying to find the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, thanks for sharing your insights, man. I really appreciate, it and I'm glad that we were able to go in and dissect this beautiful piece of work that you, you know, created you, you with your crew, and um, I can't wait for a, a hopeful season three. Um, I don't know if you're like in talks about that yet, but, um, yeah, I actually, I really want to see season one too, uh, cause I, I, d- I didn't get a chance to see season one yet, but, um, but yeah, this, it, it's, uh-huh. it, it should be interesting going back to season one. I feel they're, they're kind of different, but I, I'd, uh, love to hear what you think. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Cool, well, man. Thanks well, thanks. For me. Th- yeah, thanks yeah, for doing fun. this. Yeah, sure. definitely. I appreciate it. All right, man. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.